the talk has a bit of a of a personal history. Um, my my formal education background is in business and economics, and uh, then of course I started looking into data science. Did the course here? It's incredibly addicting. I did more and more and more. And uh, sooner or later, kind of people started coming up and said, hey, uh, we have this kind of data science problem. Can you maybe help us out? And so I started uh, doing some uh, pro bono consulting uh, for some charities and impact investors. And um, it turns out that the life and times of, a, of a machine learning practitioners often look like this. Uh, the client expects you to s s hand over the data, you train your model, you validate, you test it, you send back the model in some way, they run it in production, and you're done. And you can go on to the next thing. And it's, uh, it's the same in academia where people kind of expect you to make an approach, you test it on a common benchmark, so maybe you do ImageNet, and then you publish your approach, and then you're done. Um, but anyone who's ever worked as a more classical uh, software engineer knows that it's not done when we ship. So software engineering is all about DevOps and continuous integration and all these kinds of things. And uh, machine learning sometimes seems to have kind of uh, forgotten about it even though uh, it's especially important in machine learning. Um, so who here works in their day job with machine learning just as a, as a kind of, yeah, yeah, most people. Um, so the, the reason 101, why it's so important is that what we usually do in machine learning is we do supervised learning, which means we have some data X and we map it to some desired output Y and we learn this function that maps X to Y and uh, our model then is, is this mapping function. Uh, but what it really is, is this mapping function in our training data set, or maybe even in our validation data set. Um, so we cannot really be sure whether this mapping uh, holds true in, in the real world. Uh, so then what usually happens, you deploy, and uh, the world changes. Um, so if you have a model which maybe classifies cats and dogs, and cats and dogs look similar over time, but especially if you work maybe in finance or something, um, things change all the time, so your data might just no longer be valid. Um, another thing that happens often is that your model inputs, your features are, are kind of coming from somewhere where they're being engineered. So there's some other engineer who, who is working on that feature that you're using. The other engineer might not know that you're using that feature because you just grabbed it somewhere from a database and he has no idea that uh, your, your model is relying on his feature and maybe he's having another model predicting that feature and then he's debugging it. And so that feature distribution changes and suddenly your model um, gets into trouble. Uh, there might be unintended bugs and edge cases in your models or things that, that the model kind of struggles with um, and that you only find about later because it wasn't in your training data. And finally, especially uh, in my home field finance, uh, models influence uh, the world you try to model. So if you think about fraud detection, um, if the model starts catching the frauds, the frauds does kind of change their behavior according to your model. Um, so you have all these kinds of things and it gets wrapped up in this term of model decay. So you can, you can imagine a, a model like a fish over time, it just gets bad. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> well, what, do you, what, do you, what do you do about it? Are, are models uh, just a liability after shipping? Is all the fun in the beginning when you get to work with your uh, Keras and TensorFlow and get to come up with all these cool architectures or and afterwards it just goes down from there and you hope to hand it off to someone else. Um, actually, actually, that's exactly not the case. Um, because as it turns out, um, production environment is the perfect training environment because your data set, the data set that you're collecting, is trying to approximate the real world. It's trying to kind of represent the real world. But of course it can't because it has a limited size and uh, you made some assumptions about the world when you collected that data set and all these kinds of things. Um, but luckily for you, once you have iron production, your model is exposed to uh, lots and lots of real data. Um, and there's two things that you can do. Online learning, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide, but also there's this uh, relatively new field of active learning in which we say, hey, um, the, the outputs of our model have an have a influence on which samples we should label and these kinds of things. And active learning uh, recently made it into the Amazon shareholder letter. 
uh, which I found quite impressive. Uh, there they used it for the Alexa system to bring the need for data down by uh, as much as 40x. Uh, so that's what they tell their shareholders. Um, so uh, it's, it's a really quite powerful process. But first, active learning. So if you, if you have a smaller model, um, you might be thinking, hey, um, why don't we just continuously train it and continuously update it? And um, that's indeed a good solution for many models. Uh, the downside is that you have a lot of other things now to model. So how do you know that your model is not training in the completely wrong direction over time? Um, how, do you have a ground truth data stream? Um, you might not always yeah, have new truth coming in. Um, and uh, it can be really quite difficult if you have a big model. So if you have a big deep learning model, you cannot just keep training it all the time and you might need specialized uh, hardware and infrastructure to train your model and it's not the same. So online learning um, does not necessarily always work. Uh, what does work most of the time is active learning. Um, so how does active learning generally work is you Take a model, uh, might be a weak model, whatever you got from the data that you have. You let it make predictions on uh, data that was previously unlabeled. Um, and then you look at w where the model is less confident about. And then you label those special cases and uh, then you add them to your data set and you keep training. And the reason why that works is that you're closer to the decision boundary. If you imagine in machine learning, you have this kind of decision boundary separating your classes. Uh, you can imagine if you, if you have data that's very, very far away from the decision boundary, it doesn't really influence where the decision boundary exactly goes. But if you have data that's really, really close to it, um, then, uh, yeah, then you can um, shape the boundary much better. So that's the reason why you should... Uh, consider uh, using active learning. And we're going to get a little bit later into how and why you would do that. Uh, first, when you talk about monitoring, and especially when you come talk about production, uh, many people go like, oh, it's like ops monitoring, or uh, we have similar issues. Uh, there are some distinct differences, which are yeah make it a lot harder. Namely, that in, in model monitoring, the behavior of the model is inherently stochastic and it's kind of dependent on user behavior. Um, and you cannot say these are the clear failure points. So in ops modeling, you can kind of say if it takes longer than three seconds to load a page, that's really bad. Um, but if your output distribution, for example, for your model suddenly really shifts, it could just be that all your users try to classify a different thing. Um, so that makes it really a lot harder and there's therefore much less established guidelines on how you would do that. I'm going to link a couple of uh, papers later. Um, all of these papers uh, come from Google, and uh, they always worry a lot about scale. Um, so it's very much biased towards this massive scale. Um, so there's little ideas about how you make that more modular. Um, so it's quite different. It has its own challenging. And the first thing that you can do when you, when you deploy a model is you say, well, let's just monitor the inputs. Uh, that works really well for structured data. So there you have kind of expectations about your distributions. And I think the next talk is going to be exactly about that. How do you, how do you make sure that your data is uh, what you expect it to be? Gets a little bit more tricky uh, once you have maybe images or text or something. Uh, but as it turns out, you can quite often come up with, with some measurement whether your data is similar. For example, uh, you could say, are the word distributions in our text similar? or the text length, similar, all these kinds of things. It's, it's much more close to, um, to our small link for images. You would say, are the images bright enough or dark enough? There might be something further down the pipeline that corrupted your images. So this way, you can really sure, be sure that what arrives at your model is, uh, is what should arrive there. And that's a, it's a more standardized process. Um, the other thing that you can do is uh, you mod monitor the outputs of your model. And uh, that's a little bit harder because there you have not made as much assumption or the user, users might just uh, change a little bit. Um, but monitoring the output distribution and comparing it to your training set distribution or better yet to your validation set distribution uh, is surprisingly helpful and kind of gives you an early alert if things are different than where you expected them to be. Um, and another thing to model is maybe you just model the confidence of your model. So that is something that uh, works well for many applications where you just say, well, in, in training, our model was 
always pretty sure and now suddenly the confidence goes way down. Uh, maybe the state is weird or something. And uh, what's a new approach that some startups are trying out um, is that you say, we have the slimmer model, which we uh, run for most of our users, but um, we send a smaller subset uh, to a much bigger model, which has a better accuracy and something, or maybe to a whole ensemble of them, and uh, we just let it check against those. And um, then we can maybe infer the accuracy through that. Um, and finally, you should try to compare against ground truth. And ground truth is its own kind of tricky thing. Um, because if you're lucky, you have a constant ground truth stream coming in. So in, in credit card fraud, for example, um, about a few weeks after the fraud happens, someone will call you and say, hey, I was defrauded and your model didn't catch it. And then you have the, uh, the, thing, the ground truth coming in. Uh, if you have, a, for example, an app that classifies images or something like a Google Lens-like product, um, you won't necessarily notice if what you classified was not what it actually should have been. Um, so how do you deal with that? Um, my kind of a uh, little bit radical advice is that you label a small subset of your data uh, by hand and your data scientists should do that. And um, data scientists never want to do that. Um, but actually it turns out that if you get the UI experience of, of this labeling task right and um, then it can be much more efficient than say using mechanical turkeys. Uh, first, because your labelers will be much more high quality and you can actually rely on these ground truth labels to be ground truth. Uh, second, if you're the data scientists that work on the model also monitor the data against the classifications, they will be much more quick uh, to find a bug before it really shows up in, in a statistic. So, uh, maybe they look at images and say, oh, you know, we get so many images with low light, we didn't expect that. Or uh, smartphone cameras are just really bad or something uh, that, that is much easier to catch that way rather than if you, uh, if you do it statistically. I want to highlight a really great implementation of this UI. This is um, Prodigy. It's, it's a product um, by the same people that make Spacey. I think there were a couple of talks about Spacey. And this one, uh, really, it, it can be a simple web app like that where you have two keys, it's right, it's wrong, and then you plot the error over time and may, maybe you take a uh, turns and everybody labels a few hundred examples. It goes relatively quickly if you have this uh, kind of good AI uh, UI. And uh, in, the, in the theme of, of going with UI, um, so once you've established your metrics, you keep tracking them, uh, you might be wanting to do some alerting or maybe you want to have a dashboard where you can keep track of these metrics. And it turns out that is kind of fundamentally not a data problem, uh, but a UI UX problem. And even though this is a data science conference, um, we have to really think about who's consuming our reports. And many times that is not data scientists. Um, so the classic example is maybe that your model is going bad, all the alarm rings start ringing, and you run into the office of the CEO and say, we have to shut up down because KL divergence is at 1.5, and he will just look at you and be like, okay, um, I, don't, I don't get you, but uh, I'm definitely not going to shut down. So um, it's really important to, to um, communicate as well. And to show you uh, how this can go, is this is maybe an alerting example. So you, um, you train a model which is there to classify dog breeds. You have a couple of dogs in your, in your image. It's some kind of app. And this is your training set distribution. So there's kind of an equal amount of all the dogs in your training set distribution. And then suddenly uh, you see this kind of output distribution. And how, how should you alert this? How should you report this? What should you do? Um, there's kind of three, three options I could think of. Uh, the first one is you, uh, you measure KL divergence. You should measure it. Otherwise, you won't know uh, whether these distributions are the same or different. Um, and you could report just straight that. And as I alluded earlier, that's kind of a tricky idea. Uh, much better is if you frame it a little bit different and just do the language a little bit nicer. But what's even better is if you if you go directly to the outlier, you, you alert when the distributions are too different, but then you highlight this outlier and you say, uh, look, there, there are way more pugs than we expected. And that immediately uh, will allow one of your, of your team members to kind of uh, 
quickly scroll through the data that's coming in and see if, if people are really just taking pictures of their parks and if parks are super popular right now, um, or if it's, uh, if it's something else. So you have all this modeling and monitoring kind of, this is just a technical part to make sure that your model assumptions are correct and are right. Um, what many people that build models uh, often tend to forget or, uh, or yeah, maybe are not as aware of is that their models then have real world influences and that ultimately they are accountable for these real world influences. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this, this means that for our model, we should be able to answer for each individual prediction um, who made a decision on which ground it was made and uh, how and why it was made. There's a few other talks on model interpretability, uh, but uh, what I want, just want to stress is that we need to kind of keep track of the individual predictions of the individual transactions uh, to later go back and see why they were made, especially if we're operating in a more high stakes environment. So if you're doing dog classification, nobody will probably come after you, but if you're doing something much more high stakes, like maybe say algorithmic trading or uh, finding a place for orphans, then um, someone might come and ask like, hey, why, why was this decision made? And uh, with, with that, um, when you start monitoring these things, you start wading into the field of higher order effects. I, I hope my slide is readable from the back. The uh, contrast is not the best. Um, but what happens is that you as a data scientist are mostly concerned about your model metrics like accuracy, F1 score, and so on. And uh, the product owner whose product you're working with is concerned about user behavior like the click-through rate, and he will evaluate your metric on his metric. So if your model that has a high accuracy also increases the click-through rate, he will be happy. Otherwise, he will signal you to do something really different. And that product owner again gets evaluated by your CEO who is worrying about revenue. Um, so as you can see, this, this kind of smaller metric boils out and boils out and boils out and there's ever larger um, kind of circles around it, ever larger impacts. And um, the, these large impacts, these high order effects uh, to monitor those is extremely difficult, um, but not impossible. And I think we as a field are now just getting into how to do that. Um, because if you look at the, at the top rank, the societal impact, uh, we have now just seen in the last couple of weeks that the models that we built really might have a society changing impact, not in the way that we intended it to be. And that only happens if you uh, deploy them at huge scale. Um, so these large, large impact, be it societal impact or revenue, they're hard to monitor. Um, they're also time delayed. They only show up when you have scale. So if you're a startup and you uh, start small, you might not see them and then suddenly they're there. Um, there's exogenous factors. So that is a really open question, how to, uh, how to do these. But there are some, some um, inroads made into that. Um, and the first approach is that your users that come in contact with the, with the outbound decisions of your model are often desperate to improve uh, your product uh, because they see that your product made something extremely stupid. So uh, being good about designing the feedback for the users and being good then to link that feedback to the model, um, to the model ID and to the transaction ideas, I think the way you, uh, you can then refer back to how your model metric for that specific model impacted the experience for this user and how these higher order effects all reverberated out. Um, and this metric, this user, um, user feedback is kind of this meta metric which you probably also want to monitor and which you want to make easy to collect. Uh, you see that some firms uh, start adding like give feedback to this thing uh, thing of their website. I think that uh, is something that us machine learning engineers can hit hard on and say, no, I really want this data on how users feel about this. Um, so to, uh, to kind of wrap it up, um, I want to give an implementation example uh, because the rest of the talk has been quite theoretical and high level. If you look at... Um, most of the uh, talks, or most of the papers, 
they're made for big scale and very expensive. Uh, but actually, you can do all this monitoring uh, with completely open source software, uh, much of which you will be familiar with. So uh, in the other room, there's a, there's a token uh, serving models. You can do that perfectly with Docker and Flask. Um, and then the idea is that you take those predictions and the inputs that the model makes and you send it to, to another um, maybe Docker instance or to another microservice, uh, which I like to call the Watchman instance. And uh, this Watchman instance will then um, first store the transaction into some database and it will also compare uh, the relevant metrics and it will um, give it into your alerting so then you can send it out. Uh, so this can be done uh, relatively bare bones and relatively easy. So easy actually that I want to give a couple of lines of code how you can do that. Uh, so this first uh, code snippet is how you would uh, serve a Keras model for classification. All it does is it requests the image file, resizes it, runs it through a Keras model and then it takes out the labels and it takes a dictionary and gives back a JSON file. Um, so that is bare bones serving. And from then you pass on this output as addition to the input that you get in the, in the post request uh, to, your, to your watchdog instance. And there you can do all the statistical monitoring more or less with uh, scikit with, without many great modifications. So this is the example of the, of the dog classifier I showed earlier. Uh, first, you take some entropy measure uh, between your expected output distribution and your actual output distribution. If that exceeds some threshold, um, you go try find the worst offender. So you go f the, the, the data model for which the absolute difference in the distribution is the largest. Um, and then you can just report uh, the, the worst offender, the absolute difference, and uh, the max deviation. And it, generally creates a really nice alert, like um, there are 50% more packs than expected, the absolute deviation is this, or is, is out of bounds by a factor of two or something. Um, so as a, as a concluding remark, uh, who should do all of this? Um, generally, uh, the data science team should do it all. Um, and I feel that as a field, it will develop more towards, more towards an integrative process in which data scientists or data engineers um, will be given tools that take away the serving and the CI and all that kind of thing away from them and they can really focus on the data-driven things because all these things are fundamentally kind of data science tasks. Um, if you have a free afternoon, um, there are a couple of unsolved challenges which I uh, <laughs> would, would like to uh, get solved, um, which I kind of left out. We're not really good at versioning and data set versioning uh, yet, which are critical uh, components to this kind of monitoring system because you need to be sure which, which version you have. Um, the communication throughout the organization um, is not, is, uh, has to be improved, so we have to find a common language together with managers how we talk about these things. And managing higher order effects is, um, is something yeah, we, we are just starting to do, but it's getting extremely exciting. Um, if you want to do some reading, these are kind of my recommended reads um, on the topic. Um, the lowest one is my book, Machine Learning for Finance, which is coming out in July, uh, which has a whole chapter on the topic. And yeah, thank you all for listening. That was very yeah. interesting. Any questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, the question concerns uh, extending your data set with new labeled data. Uh, you said uh, the interesting points are the ones that the model is a bit uh, unsecure about. Yeah. But especially in uh, perhaps regions of feature space where you don't have too much data. This number could be quite un unreliable. Um, any thoughts on how to deal with that? Yeah, so there's a, there's a pretty large range how to quantify uncertainty about something. Um, there was a talk here earlier on Thompson something which has like a Bayesian approach. So there's many different ones. Um, if you are not too worried about labeling a few more things, um, just and you have a classification task, uh, take the top uh, prediction softmax output and the lowest prediction softmax output 
uh, subtract them, and um, that's how you go. And otherwise, you can do something a little bit more advanced. So there's many different ways. Anybody else? For the data set and modeling versioning, I can highly recommend setting up your own Git LFS server. Yeah. So you can yeah. just keep your model and depending on the size of your data, but all the data with your model and at least if you want to figure out how was this model trained, just go back to the revision yeah. and try it out. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Please give another round of applause. Thank you.